Good morning, brothers and sisters. One of the reasons that the Lord had me start this channel was because I believe that He wants me to encourage the body of Christ during this time of waiting and trusting in the Lord for His return. See, God is not surprised by our trials. He knows that we are living in a time of great distress, intense spiritual attack, and signs of the times all around us. So the best way that I can equip the body of Christ is to be completely honest with how I'm feeling and what the Lord is showing me. All that I have, brothers and sisters, comes from the Spirit of God. Apart from Christ, I can bear no no fruit. And so every day I wake up and I say, Lord, help me to decrease so that you can increase, Lord. May you will and act according to your good pleasure within me. And I want to start with an example from my own life to teach you guys and help build you guys up from the story of Jonah. And the and and the thing is is we are a lot like Jonah. We are a lot like Jonah and I'm gonna explain. So how many of us when watching the news, if we're honest with ourselves, hope that something bad happens. Hope that something drastically changes the landscape of our world. You know we We get impatient waiting for the Lord. And we're like, Lord, we don't want it to be like the days of Noah. We almost want something bad to happen, to speed things along, to make things go quicker so that you can come back sooner. And the Lord said in my spirit, a lot of my children are acting like Jonah. So today I wanted to go through portions of the book of Jonah and the lessons we can learn from Jonah to explain how we need to reorder our attitude when it comes to waiting for the Lord to return. Now, if we go to Jonah chapter 1 and verses 1 through 3, we see that the word of the Lord came to Jonah and and God said, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But what did Jonah do? He arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them from the presence of the Lord. So here we see Jonah fleeing. And I often wondered, why did he flee from the presence of the Lord? Well, let's go on and we can see that there is a reason that Jonah fled from the presence of the Lord. If we look at chapter 2, verse 7, uh, Jonah said, When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. So, Jonah is talking about being in the whale's belly, and he's kind of coming to a realization that he is disobeying God. He's not acting in according to God's will, and he remembers that if he prays, God hears prayer, right? And then he goes on to verse 8 and 9, Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited vomited Jonah up unto dry land. So then we move along to chapter 3, verse 10. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Now Jonah finally obeyed. He went to Nineveh and he preached that God was about to judge Nineveh. And here we see that God literally relented from a judgment on Nineveh. But what was Jonah's reaction? Chapter 4, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, wasn't this not what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled. For I know that you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to live, or excuse me, for me to die than to live. So why? Why did he act this way? Well, he acted this way because the city of Nineveh was wicked and he wanted to see God judge it. And sometimes we are just like Jonah. Sometimes we wish bad things would happen to this world to bring judgment and speed things up, such as La Palma and, uh, you know, earthquakes and war. We want to see bad things happen because it's it's a sign that God is coming back. But, but, you know, we have to say, Lord, we're so sorry, God, for acting this way. We're, We're being selfish. We're putting on a pity party. 
And so what was God's response to how Jonah acted? He, a- he always asks a question. He asked him a question, is it right for you to be angry, Jonah? Is it right for you to be angry? Is it right for us to be angry that Jesus has not come back? That he is not pouring out the judgments? That the tribulation has not begun yet? Is it right for us to feel this way? You know, God always reasons with us with questions, right? In 1 Samuel, he says, what have you done? In 2 Samuel, he says, why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? Isaiah 6, he says, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? In Matthew 16, he says, why, who do you say that I am? Matthew 20, he says, what do you want me to do for you? Acts 9, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So God always asks questions when he wants to rebuke us or get us to ponder why we are feeling this way. And God asked me a question about a month ago as I was pleading for the Lord to come back in the rapture because I wanted it to happen that day. And the Lord reasoned with me and he said, he said, if I were to bring more souls to salvation, could you wait till the end of October for me to, to come back in the rapture? I said, yes, Lord. And then he said, okay, if you knew that I would save your entire family, would you wait till the end of November? And I said, yes. And then he spoke to me and said, that is my heart. I am not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. And so he asked me a question and he rebuked me by asking this question. Now, what did, jo- what did, what did God do to teach Jonah this lesson that he was being ridiculous in, um, in his response? Well, he prepared three things. He prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah to shade him. Then he prepared a worm so that it damaged the plant. And then he prepared an east wind that the sun would beat on Jonah's head and so that he grew faint. And then he wished death for himself and said, it is better for me to die than to live. And then then God again asked that question, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, is it right for me to be angry even to death? But the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between the right hand and their left and much livestock? So God's love for the people of Nineveh, whom he created, is far different from Jonah's indifference to their damnation and greater than Jonah's warped concern for a wild plant for which he had done nothing. God was ready to spare Sodom for 10 righteous people. How much more a city which include, included 120,000 small children identified as those who cannot discern their right hand from their left. So brothers and sisters, what I think God is trying to teach Jonah is that Jonah didn't do anything to create these people and God loves these people despite their wickedness. Remember the Bible says God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And sometimes we are like Jonah. We just want to see judgment poured down on this earth and we want to get out of here. And notice that Jonah left the city and he waited for the Lord to pour out judgment. And God used that plant and the shade and the worm and the wind to rebuke Jonah. And he asked Jonah a question. And sometimes that's what he will do with us. We're like, we kind of hope something bad happens. We hope La Palma falls into the sea and causes a tsunami because so many people have been having dreams that the rapture happens when the tsunami happens. And I think we have it all twisted, brothers and sisters. We have the wrong attitude. And we are not conforming ourselves to Christ's likeness when we act this way. And again, I am preaching to myself because I have had these thoughts. I have wanted bad things to happen. I've wanted things to shake up this earth so that the rapture would happen quicker. But just as God asked Jonah a question, is it right for you to be angry? He asked us the same question. Is it right for you saints to want judgment when my heart is to be long suffering, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. And so we must remember that salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is long suffering. Salvation is God in his mercy. How many of us, If we were not saved 
and then got saved, let's say in December, how many of us would have be so thankful to the Lord that he didn't come back to rapture us on the feast days in October when many of us were begging God to do that, when many of us were looking for God to rapture us during those feast days? How grateful would we be that God waited just a couple more months to save us so that we wouldn't have to go through the tribulation? So brothers and sisters, it's my job to be honest and to, to talk about the things that many are not talking about, to just basically speak the thoughts that many of us have out loud so that we can be honest, so we can be moldable, and God can prune us and sharpen us. Because remember, brothers and sisters, we're not to be like Jonah, sitting idly by under a shade tree waiting for judgment. We're to be busy about the Lord's business. We're to be working, working hard for the Lord until he comes back. I wanted to end with this quote that was sent to me from a devotion by a brother in Christ. And it's from Oswald Chambers' devotion, and it just so happens to fall on today. Quote, After sanctification, it is difficult to state what your purpose in life is because God has moved into his purpose through the Holy Spirit. He is using you now for his purpose throughout the world as he used his son for the purpose of our salvation. If you seek great things for yourself, thinking, God has called me for this or for that, you barricade God from using you. As long as you maintain your own personal interests and ambitions, you cannot be completely aligned or identified with God's interests. This can only be accomplished by giving up all your personal plans once and for all, and by allowing God to take you directly into his purpose for the world. Your understanding of your ways must also be surrendered because they are now the ways of the Lord. I must learn that the purpose of my life belongs to God, not me. God is using me for his great purpose, excuse me, for his great personal perspective. And all, his, all he asks of me is that I trust him. I should never say, Lord, this causes me such heartache. To talk that way makes me a stumbling block. When I stop telling God what I want, he can freely work his will in me without any hindrance. He can crush me, exalt me, or do anything else he chooses. He simply asks me to have absolute faith in him and his goodness. Self-pity is of the devil, and if I wallow in it, I cannot be used by God for his purpose in the world. Doing this creates for me my own cozy world within the world, and God will not be allowed to move me from it because of my fear of being frostbitten.